Welcome to The World This Week with Alicia Edwards, a look back at some of the biggest global news stories for an international city, brought to you by the London Live News team. Tonight, Ukraine faces a surge in COVID deaths as just 16% of its population have accepted the jab, with false vaccine certificates being sold on the black market. 77 weeks since schools closed in Uganda. With no sign of reopening, children in the country have taken up mining for gold. And Princess Marco chooses love over her royal status as she officially gave up her title to marry her college boyfriend. It's all on the way before 7.30, but first tonight, world leaders from across the globe are making their way to the COP26 summit in Glasgow this weekend. The two-week-long conference starting tomorrow will see more than 120 leaders coming together to focus on tackling climate change. It follows a week of demonstrations with protesters targeting buildings and major roads in London. On Friday, protesters took to the capital with activist Greta Thunberg in attendance. She was one of thousands protesting across 26 countries and every continent in the world on Friday to demand the global financial system stops putting money into the use of fossil fuels. Well, speaking ahead of the summit, Sir David Attenborough and senior scientific advisers from around the world gathered to issue a statement calling on leaders to take urgent action to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Attenborough stood aboard the large polar ship named after him and urged leaders to listen to science. Would it not be marvellous to suppose that as a consequence of our discoveries and that science is discoveries, that the nations of the world joined together and actually did something at COP in this coming conference. Let us see what it does. But I hope and pray that, my goodness, it takes action that the nations of the world, in the light of the scientific discoveries that this ship will undoubtedly be making, that nations got together and listened to the science Sir David Attenborough there. Now, concerns have already been raised over how likely the summit is to successfully agree on the changes needed. Earlier this week, Boris Johnson admitted he was very worried about the success of the talks. We, we need to, as many people as possible to agree to go to net zero so that they're, they're not producing too much carbon dioxide by, by the middle of the, of the century. Now, I think it can be done. It's going to be very, very tough this summit and I'm very worried because it, it might go it might go wrong and we might not get the agreements that we need and it's it's touch and go. Well, two leaders not set to be in attendance are Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin. With Russia and China being two of the world's biggest polluters, there are concerns over how successful the summit could be. Well, efforts have been made to ensure the event itself is as sustainable as possible. Delegates are being encouraged to walk, cycle or use public transport to travel to the events. But several routes around the venue are closing for up to three weeks, which is likely to cause disruption. The venues will use low-carbon alternative energy sources with solar energy traffic lights and hydro-treated vegetable oil in generators instead of diesel, while only electric or low-emission vehicles will be in place. Well, also this week, the Queen had to withdraw from the event on medical advice. The 95-year-old monarch was due to travel to Scotland on Monday, but she will now record a video address for delegates. She's seen here back in the summer at the Eden Project with the G7 group. Royal biographer Hugo Vickers says not attending COP26 is a sensible decision. The Queen will be very disappointed. She doesn't like to disappoint people. She knows that a lot of world leaders are coming, and so she won't have taken this decision lightly. But you must remember that she's 95 years old, and um, she clearly has been exhausted. And so it's no doubt a very sensible decision. 
royal biographer Hugo Vickers there reflecting on how the Queen has handled not being able to attend that summit, which gets underway tomorrow. Right, let's head to France next, where a UK boat was detained this week after getting caught up in the worsening row with France over post-Brexit fishing rights. The scallop vessel was ordered to divert to the port of Le Havre after the French authorities said it was fishing in French waters without a licence. The incident came amid anger in France after the UK and Jersey turned down applications from dozens of French boats to fish in their waters. French ministers have warned they will block British boats from some French ports and tighten checks on vessels travelling between France and the UK if the issue is not resolved by Tuesday. To Russia now, shops, restaurants and schools have shut in Moscow in a lockdown as Russia battles record COVID deaths and infections. Only essential shops like supermarkets and pharmacies are allowed to open in the capital. Starting today, authorities have given workers across Russia nine days off in a bid to curb infections. Well, people in Moscow hurried to vaccination centres in the city centre this week to get their jabs ahead of the new restrictions today. Day. A local doctor said they are calling on elderly people to get vaccinated. We have people of different ages, mostly it's middle-aged and young people, but we would like, of course, to have more elderly people because they are mostly exposed to infections and risk of severe complications. Well, the government has blamed the quick spread of the virus and soaring deaths on low vaccination rates. This comes as Ukraine is also facing a surge in new coronavirus infections and deaths, also spurred by a slow vaccine uptake. Ukrainians have been offered a choice between four vaccines with strong supply, but only 16% of the eligible population have been fully vaccinated, the second lowest share in Europe after Armenia. It's putting the nation's healthcare system under severe stress. A nurse at this hospital in Odessa said a shortage of hospital porters meant she had to carry a patient into the intensive care unit with her own hands after the surgical ward ran out of oxygen. The head of the city's regional hospitals says the consumption of oxygen has tripled over the past fortnight and most of the patients are not vaccinated. Dr. Olga Selenko has seen this firsthand. Unfortunately, for some reason, our people were late to realise the necessity of vaccination. We are now in the red zone. Hospitals, family doctors are packed. Of course, if it had been done earlier, if we had vaccinated people in time, probably we wouldn't be on the edge. Well, Ukraine's health minister, Viktor Lyashko, has said that about half of Ukrainian medics have remained reluctant to get the shots themselves, with ministers saying that fake vaccination certificates have gone on the black market, as many have sought them for travelling abroad and dealing with new restrictions imposed by the authorities. More on the global impact of the pandemic. Uganda's schools are still shut down after more than 77 weeks, the longest anywhere in the world. The East African country is now the only one in Africa where schools remain closed, according to the UN Children's Agency. Some children have become working, some mining for gold. Annette is 16 years old. Staying at home sometimes, you cannot have any morale to read books. And you can just somehow sometimes just forget what they they told they told you at school. And then you just see, stop even reading books, because they they have been telling us that you are going back to school. You are going back to school. You wait until you just get tired. Even you can't even read a book. Annette there, well, President Yuri Museveni says schools will only reopen after 5 million of the country's 44 million people are fully vaccinated. So far, Uganda is just halfway there, administering 2.5 million doses, with only about 700,000 people fully vaccinated. To the US now, bringing you pictures from the aftermath of a tornado in western Louisiana on Wednesday. It damaged more than a dozen homes in a part of the state still struggling to recover from repeated weather disasters. 
Two people were injured. A woman was hurt when a window was blown into her home and a man was cut on the leg by flying debris. The tornado was part of a line of severe weather that moved from Texas across southern Louisiana and into Mississippi, bringing severe rain and lightning as it swept through the region. April Pettifer and her daughter Abigail said they hid in a bathroom during the storm. I heard a loud noise and I felt like the windows breaking, so I went to go check on her in her room to make sure she was okay. And then everything kind of happened in the living room where I had been and... We moved into, into the, the bathroom, bathroom and quickly. then it was over really fast, so it was very surprising. We actually just watched them say, oh, there's probably not going to be any tornadoes in Calcasieu Parish. It looks terrible. There's a uh, <laughs> wood that's flown across the house and paled another wall. Two big walls are down. A wall moved out. Yeah, the yeah. back of the house is kind of gone. and trees so. and, yeah. It's terrible. It's not good. It looks like we got hit by a tornado. Yeah. <laughs> Funnily enough. They are the Pettifer family there in Louisiana. Now the world this week continues after the break. We'll be taking a look at the Chancellor's autumn budget as the Prime Minister joined him to toast a cut on alcohol tax. And with Halloween upon us, we'll be looking at how people are preparing around the world. See you in just a few minutes. Hello, welcome back. You're watching The World This Week from the London Live News team, a review of the main international stories that have broken over the last seven days. Still to come before 7.30. Florida manatees are dying in record numbers because of polluted water. We'll hear from a fishing guide who had spotted changes in the water in the Sunshine State. But first, some news from the UK. The Chancellor set out his autumn budget on Wednesday, preparing for what he called a new economy post-Covid, with economic recovery following the pandemic looking more positive than previously thought. Let's just take a look at some of the key points. Employment is up. Investment is growing. Public services are improving. The public finances are stabilising and wages are rising. Inflation in September was 3.1% and is likely to rise further, with the OBR expecting CPI to average 4% over the next year. Today's forecasts show that we are, in fact, scheduled to return to 0 0.7 in 2425 before the end of this parliament. The independent low pay commission brings together economists, business groups and trades unions. The government is accepting their recommendation to increase the national living wage next year by 6.6% .6 to £9.50 an hour. With fuel prices at the highest level in eight years, I'm not prepared to add to the squeeze on families and small businesses. So I can confirm today the planned rise in fuel duty will be cancelled. Yeah. That's a saving over the next five years of almost £8 billion. We are slashing the number of main duty rates from 15 to just six. Our new system will be designed around a common sense principle. The stronger the drink, the higher the rate. I can announce that flights between airports in England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland will, from April 2023, be subject to a new, lower rate of air passenger duty. This will help cut, cost, uh, cut the cost of living, with 9 million passengers seeing their duty cut by half. Chancellor Rishi Sunak there. Well, in response, Labour's shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves said Sunak was living in a parallel universe. Businesses hit by a supply chain crisis. Those who rely on our schools and our hospitals and our police. They won't recognise the world that the Chancellor is describing. They will think that he is living in a parallel universe. The Chancellor in this budget has decided to cut taxes for banks. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, at least the bankers on short haul flights sipping champagne will be cheering this budget today. 
Well, the Prime Minister and the Chancellor were doing just that themselves after the budget announcement. The pair went to visit a brewery in London, marking the reduction in taxes for alcohol, a move that's been welcomed by the nighttime industries. Most pubs and brewers will be happy tonight with what they've seen, with the support for beer and the support for pubs and that community spirit that both will foster. Um, of course, the business rates uh, reduction to 50% and cancelling of the multiplier is worth an awful lot, nearly 200 million alone to the sector. And there's a full range of cost savings on beer duty. We're looking at 440 million to the sector. So I think today is a good day um, for British beer and for British pubs. There we are. That was Emma McClarkin, the chief executive of the British Beer and Pub Association. Right, some other stories now. In Japan, Princess Marco gave up her royal status this week after choosing to marry a commoner. Just a warning, there are flashing images on the way. The pair met at university in Tokyo five years ago and announced their engagement in 2017. Marco has declined the 140 million yen payment which she was entitled to for leaving the imperial family. We see her here bowing to her father, mother and younger sister and saying goodbye. She also skipped the usual traditions of a royal wedding. In a news conference, Marco said the marriage was a necessary choice. The pair are now expected to move to the US. In Israel, a court has ordered a six-year-old boy who survived a cable car crash in Italy to be returned to his relatives there. Itan Baran's paternal aunt has been locked in a custody battle with family members in Israel after he was brought there following the crash. The boy's parents and younger sibling were among 14 killed in May when a cable car went into a mountainside in northern Italy. The court ordered Itan Baran be returned to the place of his normal residence, which is Italy. It ordered his grandfather, who brought him to Israel against the wishes of his family members in Italy, to pay expenses and attorney fees. In football, Adelaide United's Josh Cavallo became the only known current male top flight professional footballer in the world to come out, saying he hopes to inspire and show people that it's OK to be yourself and play football. The 21-year-old used social media to share his statement ahead of the new A-League season, which starts in November. There's something personal that I need to share with everyone. I'm a footballer and I'm gay. Growing up, I always felt the need to hide myself, you know, because I was ashamed. And ashamed I'll never be able to do what I love and be gay. You know, hiding who I truly am to pursue a dream I always wished for as a kid. All I want to do is play football and be treated equally. Josh Cavallo there to the US now and Florida is experiencing an unprecedented loss of manatees this year with 959 documented deaths as of mid-October. Scientists have blamed a lack of food. The so-called sea cows mostly eat seagrass and that's also dying as water quality declines due to man-made pollution. Captain Paul Fafeta is the president of the Clean Water Coalition of Indian River County and takes tourists out to see the manatees. The brown algae that you see in there right now um, is choking out the seagrasses. It's not a toxic algae, but again, it's, it's enough that the sunlight cannot get through it to, you know, for the photosynthesis for the seagrasses underneath it. And they're, they're choking out. There's some of the stuff that, that's matted up, that's floating, it's small clumps of it. On two different charters um, with clients, I have come across uh, one manatee just to the north of here, um, about a mile and a half, and another one to the south of here, about three miles, um, that I called into FWC that had not been reported. I had seen a few others that had been reported as well. But it's, it's not good when you've got clients on the boat and all of a sudden there's a, a dead manatee, they're wanting to see him, they don't want to see him dead. I do live on the lagoon. I don't see many manatees at all. And, you know, over the last 10, since 2010, because the seagrass has been steadily declining. The problem that needs to be remediated is to clean up the water. We've got to reduce the nutrients and the toxins going into the water everywhere throughout the state. 
scenes from Indian River County in Florida there. Now, finally tonight, as spooky season is well and truly upon us, people across the globe are preparing for celebrations tomorrow. Here in the UK, Cadbury World Chocolatiers in Birmingham have created a witch made entirely of chocolate for this year's display. Weighing 10 kilograms, the creation took chocolatiers Donna and Dawn just two days to make. Well, in the capital, a more traditional approach to festivities. Hampton Court Palace has created a pumpkin display to look like Henry VIII's six wives. Right, sticking with pumpkins in Hong Kong, one designer has gone bigger than most this year with a five-storey tall pumpkin sculpture on Victoria Harbour. The organisers say not many people trick or treat in Hong Kong and other than dressing up in costumes, there aren't many options for kids to enjoy the festival. The designer of the installation wanted to make something for children to enjoy. Because for Hong Kong, there are a lot of celebrations for adults at Halloween, such as in Lang Kwai Fong or bars in other districts. But for kids, there are not so many celebration activities. Unlike foreign countries, we do not have houses for them to decorate. Therefore, we decided to hold a Halloween-themed event, especially for kids. To Mexico now, preparations for the Day of the Dead Parade are underway in Mexico City after it was cancelled last year due to the pandemic. Traditional altars have been made at this workshop for more than 30 years. The parade is a new tradition though after the James Bond movie Spectre showed a fictional parade as part of Mexican Day of the Dead traditional celebrations. Although it had never actually been done, the film's proposal was so successful that it ended up turning the parade into a reality. It's expected that at least 2 million people between tourists and locals will come to see the parade tomorrow. That's all from the world this week with Alicia Edwards. We'll see you at 7 next Saturday as we round up the biggest international stories for a global city.